Before we get started, I thought I'd take this opportunity to congratulate Mary and Aaron and the rest of the Mizo Foundation staff for putting on such an awesome symposium. I would say that session this morning on BAP1, it was, a, it, it was truly amazing to see all the leading investigators in uh, dermatology and ophthalmology and mesothelioma and all the lead authors on all the seminal articles here in this room to present their data. I mean, that's quite a feat. And the uh, speakers this afternoon with regards to their uh, scientific work uh, based on the funding from the foundation, I think you can see how this really inspires a lot of uh, forward thinking and hopefully will lead to uh, future progress. And that leads us really to this session, which I'm also very excited about. Um, this is the first time that we're doing this endeavor where we're partnering, partnering with the pharmaceutical companies. And I think this is a really important partnership. Um, as we all know, mesothelioma is a rare disease, and while we see a lot of the scientific work that's being done, in reality, when it comes time to running clinical trials and developing new drugs, a lot of that work comes not only from institutions with scientists, but also from pharmaceutical companies and their scientists. And in order to get these clinical trials done, we need patients, and what better way to make that connection than with the Miso Foundation? So this partnership is really important, and we thought this would be a great opportunity to allow uh, these companies to present their data to us and show us the trials. This is actually gonna be an amazing time. Over the next year or two, there are multiple clinical trials that are gonna be opening uh, for patients with mesothelioma, and I really think that there are some amazing drugs that are being developed right now that have immense potential. And so it's even more important that we funnel the patients to these clinical trials so that the, these studies can get done in an appropriate time frame and that we can get the data and we can improve our treatments. So uh, we have two uh, companies that are here today to present their data. The first is uh, Morphotech, and the speaker is gonna be Dr. Julie Maltzman. She's the senior medical director for Morphotech, and she's gonna talk about the data with their drug, Morab009, which now has a name, amituximab. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, thank you very much for giving us the opportunity to be here in front of you today. We, we appreciate it and we do think that this partnership is vital for the success as monies are getting tighter and tighter for academic institutions. I think a partnership with among everybody together, foundations, academic institutions, pharma would probably be the way to go, and governments. Oops. So the slides, or the, what I'm gonna present today was presented before at the International Mesothelioma Interest Group meeting back in September of 2012 in Boston. They were presented by Dr. Rafid Hassan from the NCI, a name probably well known to, to this foundation. So I hope I will do the credit that he did. Uh, these are the exact slides, nothing's been altered, and these are the disclosures of all the authors. So as Dr. Krug mentioned, we, or Morphotech, has a monoclonal chimeric antibody, part murine, part human, to um, to mesothelin. Mesothelin is a biomarker that we heard a lot about from Dr. Pass earlier this morning and, um, and others. Mesothelin is a glycoprotein. It's a protein with a sugar moiety attached to it that's an expressed on many mesothelial cells, plural um, pericardium even and peritoneal. It is expressed in high amounts in malignant mesothelioma, especially epithelial. So its prevalence in malignant, epithelioma, uh, me malignant mesothelioma and the preclinical synergy that we saw with certain chemotherapies, along with safety parameters that we saw in the phase one study, enabled or provided the motivation for the phase two study. Phase two study was done. I feel like I'm either too close or too far, so I'm, I apologize. 
phase two study was done. It was a very simple study, maybe too simple. It was a single arm study. It involved multiple centers where we took standard of care chemotherapy for mesothelioma, which is pemetrexate and cisplatinum, and combined it with the antibody called amituximab for mesothelin. The primary endpoint was the rate of progression-free survival, how long patients live without progressing, and secondary objectives were the usual objectives, response rate, overall survival, and safety. Patients must have had malignant mesothelioma, plural. It may have been epithelial, the cell type may have been epithelial, or biphasic, meaning having some sort of sarcomatoid features in it. They may not have had previous chemotherapy, it was a first-line study, and their physicians must have deemed them to be non-surgical candidates. So they may not have been uh, previously operated on. Everyone had to have a good performance status. This particular study used the Karnofsky scale, 70 or above, and the schema is what you see here. So the red ar arrows indicate the time that patients got chemotherapy, pemetrexid and cisplatinum, every three weeks. And the green triangles represent the times that the antibody was administered. So it was week one, week two, off for a week. Week one, week two, off for a week. Patients received, after having received four cycles or six cycles of chemotherapy, as was deemed necessary by their physician, could continue, provided they had a response, on just the antibody alone without the chemotherapy in a maintenance-like setting. In the end, this trial enrolled 89 subjects, 89 patients from the US and Europe. The average age was 67, and greater than two-thirds of these folks were men. About 90% of them had stage four or three disease, stage three or four advanced disease. Remember, you didn't have to have stage three or four disease. You just have to have been deemed unresectable by your physician and surgeon. And most folks, about 85, 90% almost, had a good performance status of Karnofsky 90 to 100. Most individuals had epithelial histology to their mesothelioma, but about 10% had mixed, which means they had sarcomatoid component to it. So safety first. The safety profile of amituximab, meso uh, amituximab, cisplatinum, and pemetrexid turned out to be very similar to what one would expect with chemotherapy alone. The toxicities that we see, nausea, fatigue, anorexia, vomiting, diarrhea, constipation, are things that are traditionally reported with chemotherapy. With one exception, I would highlight to your attention that we did see hypersensitivity reactions. Hypersensitivity reaction is basically a, an allergic reaction to the antibody. That was unique and not seen traditionally in chemotherapy studies. The side effect profile that was seen when the antibody was given alone reflects really the natural history of the disease as well, dyspnea and fatigue. Regretfully, as far as efficacy is concerned, this study did not reach its primary endpoint. It was not considered a positive study. The progression-free survival rate in this study was 52%. We had hoped for it to be 62%. What that means in terms of time is that the progression, the, pa the, time, the amount of time patients are alive without progression on this study was about 6.1 months. Now recall I said this was a single arm study, which means that we didn't have an internal comparison. We didn't have folks who were on chemotherapy with antibody versus folks on just chemotherapy to compare the two. So we're just left to compare it to what we know from the literature, from the textbooks, from historical controls. And historically, from what we know from the textbooks, six months is about the average time that folks live after chemotherapy with pemetrexid and cisplatinum if their disease is not amenable to surgery, live without progression. The response rate was about 40%. They were all partial responses. Stabilization of disease was about 50%. But overall survival, and overall survival, was about 14.8 months. Again, if we compare it to the textbooks, that's a little bit longer than what we know traditionally as the overall survival of folks with unresectable, malignant pleural mesothelioma that have had pemetrexid and cisplatinum. This is the traditional Kaplan-Meier curve that everyone throws up. So the way to read this is actually quite easy. On the y-axis, you have progression. On the x-axis, you have time. So median refers to the middle number, so we find 50% of median, the average 
amount of progression, and we draw an imaginary line from 50% to where it meets the curve, and then we drop down to the x-axis, and this shows you exactly what I said, that for progression-free survival, the median progression-free survival for this study was about six months. The median overall survival for this study, at 50% of patients were alive at 14.8 months, doing the same sort of exercise, finding 50% going to the curve and dropping down. Interestingly enough, patients who were strong enough and were able to take at least four cycles of pemetrexid and cisplatinum, so the, the strongest, the healthiest patients, if you will, they had a median pro, um, overall survival of close to 20 months, 19, 19.8, I believe it was. And the other thing that was intriguing or piqued our curiosity at Morphotech is that there were a, quite a few patients right here that were alive after two years. So we wanted to find out who those patients are. Our antibody is targeted to mesothelin. Mesothelin is a well-known biomarker in mesothelioma, as we heard all about this morning. The trouble is, mesothelin binds our antibody. So as soon as we give the antibody to the patient, we cannot measure mesothelin anymore because it's bound to the antibody and it interferes with our available um, assay techniques. So we wanted to see if there was another protein that we could measure that would give us some information about mesothelin and we could follow it longitudinally throughout the study. As it turns out, the fragment of DNA that codes for mesothelin, the other side of it codes for a protein called megakaryocyte proliferating factor, or MPF for short. So we thought maybe we can measure MPF in the serum, and maybe that would give us information about mesothelin in the serum, if the two correlate. So this exercise was to see if the two correlate or not. And it turns out, if you look on the y-axis, baseline MPF back, um, level, and on the x-axis, me baseline mesothelin, this slide, with the ability to draw a straight line through them, show that there is a very high correlation between the two. And we could follow one if we can't follow the other. This was an interesting learning from this non-randomized study. So we wanted to look at other biomarkers. Mesothelin is one that we've talked about. We now know that MPF correlates highly with mesothelin, so maybe we can learn something by following it. And CA125 was something that we wanted to look at also. Now that's a tumor marker that's traditionally associated with ovarian cancer, and that's how you may have heard of it, but it's also expressed in mesothelioma. So to try to understand these biomarkers, we used a statistical approach called chi-square. This slide may be too busy to read, but just so you know, a chi-squared test is a statistical trick, a statistical manipulation, if you will, that is based on a two-by-two two table where you have your clinical outcome of interest. We basically want to know who dies and who survives. And how does that relate to a biomarker of interest, to a number, anywhere from zero to whatever, to infinity? So this test finds the cutoff of this biomarker, a cutoff portion in this, of this biomarker level, where these two groups of patients could be as far away as possible, could be as disparate as possible, to really separate the groups of folks who are alive or those who succumb to the disease. So in other words, it will enable us to say, aha, if you have a, a biomarker at this level or higher, you will do well or you will do poorly. Does that make sense? So using the chi-square approach, we looked at baseline serum mesothelin. And it turns out that the chi-square approach told us that 33.14 nanograms per milliliter is the most optimal cutoff to see the difference between these two groups. If your baseline serum mesothelin is less than that, less than 33, 53% of those patients are alive at the time of this analysis. Conversely, if your serum baseline mesothelin is greater than 33, 72% of those folks are not alive at the time of the analysis. 
And by graphically, it looks like this. The blue line represents those folks with a serum baseline mesothelium that is low, below 33. And the red line represents those folks with a serum mes mesothelin level that is high, above 33. And you use the same thing that we did before as we go to 50%. We draw imaginary line to the graph. You could see that actually patients with a low serum mesothelin have an overall survival of close to 19 months, 18.5. Those folks with a high serum mesothelin have an overall survival of 12 months. We did the same thing with baseline MPF, megacaryocyte potentiating factor. And because we saw a very high correlation with mesothelin, it's not surprising to see the results that I'm about to show you. Those folks who had a baseline serum MPF of less than five, 57% of them were alive at the time of, the di of uh, analysis. Conversely, those folks who had a serum MPF baseline of greater than five, about 76% of them were dead at the time of diagnosis. And graphically, it looks exactly like this, with the blue line being those folks with a low serum MPF, and the red line being those folks with the high serum MPF, and we see consistent numbers. Patients with the low serum MPF have an overall survival of, four, of um, 14 point, sorry, 18.5 months. Those folks with a higher level have an overall survival of 12 months. We did the same exercise for CA125, and we found the same thing. Lower levels of CA125, less than six, 36% of those folks were alive at the time of the analysis. Conversely, 82% of the folks with a high serum CA125 had expired at the time of the analysis. And graphically, it looks like this. Now, these curves kind of cross over one another early on in the study in months two, four, six, but certainly at 50%, where we read it at the median on average, they were disparate and separated into those with a low CA125 being alive over 20 months. So the, this slide summarizes everything that I told you about all three biomarkers, mesothelin, MPF, and CA125. It shows you the cutoff level by the chi-square test that shows the separation the greatest, and it also shows you the commensurate survival for each one of these groups. What does this mean? It is still highly experimental. It's not often used in treatment, as far as I know. And we don't really know what it means to have a CA125 of six or less, because some labs claim that up to 25 may be normal whatever normal is, the spectrum of normal. What it means, I don't know, but it was eyebrow raising to see an overall survival of 20 months. So in summary, the safety of amituximab in combination with standard of care chemotherapy for mesothelioma, pemetrexid, and cisplatinum was consistent with that seen just for chemotherapy. The response rate was 40% for overall response rate, which was all partial response, with 50% stable disease. The median time for without progression was about six months, which is about what we see in the textbooks. The median overall survival for this patient population was 14.8 months, which is slightly better than what we see in textbooks. At the time that these data were presented by Dr. Hassan, there were 29 patients on study, but now there are 16 patients that are on study being in follow-up with only one still receiving the antibody. And it seems that in this small study of 89 patients, baseline mesothelin, CA125, and MPF levels that are lower portend for a better prognosis than those that are higher. Thank you very much. <laughs> Mind if I ask you if you Please. Questions. Um, hopefully, these questions will be representative of what the, some of the people in the audience would want to ask. Um, so, uh, tell me a little bit about your plans uh, from here. Are you going to continue studying this agent? Yeah, so unfortunately, we wish we had done a study where we had two arms to compare one to another and uh, comparing it to history and textbooks, you're always separated in time and, and, and perhaps not choosing the right patient population. So we would really very much like to pursue this 
and in a randomized trial to see if this, these results would be consistent if we compare it within the context of one study. So those are our plans. I think that really highlights uh, some of the issues with trial design in this particular disease, particularly in the first line setting where you're giving it in combination with the chemotherapy. Um, and so I guess uh, one question would be, um, do you take away any lessons from that? And in particular, um, about the choice of uh, an endpoint. Uh, obviously, this has some implications, not just for your company, but for other companies that will be designing similar types of trials in the future. Um, you know, you indicated that this was a negative trial because it didn't meet your PFS endpoint, yet you're still planning to pursue it in another larger study, so. No, that's a very good and poignant question. Um, we didn't see a PFS advantage. We think we may have seen an overall survival advantage. The overall survival is really the holy grail of what we're looking for. Um, because it wasn't randomized, it's very difficult to tease out the subtleties. There are some hypotheses that claim that because this is an antibody and works by sort of stimulating your own immune system to fight the, the cancer, that maybe um, asking for progression-free survival was not realistic. But for increased overall survival and keeping the disease at bay is probably a better and more accurate endpoint for this kind of treatment. So um, we think that we can improve upon the study by first of all making it randomized and second of all is making overall survival as our primary endpoint. We may have to wait longer, which no one wants to do, but it may be a better study. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned your drug is a chimeric antibody. I wonder if you could explain in a little bit more detail what that means and also the implications of that with regards to the hypersensitivity reactions and also the potential for antibodies, human antibodies against your drug. So that's also a great question. I hope I could do it justice. So an antibody is composed really of two parts, a part that recognizes the bad guy, the antigen, the virus or the tumor, and a part that's the good guy that is recognized by your own white blood cells. And the way that antibodies are made, the part, or this antibody was made, the part that recognizes the bad guy is human because your mesothelin is human mesothelin. The part that is recognized by the white blood cells, or the other way around, I just, I apologize. The part that's recognized by white blood cells is actually human. The part that recognizes the mesothelin was, was murine. The murine meaning from a mouse. From a mouse. <laughs> um, the body senses something foreign in the body. It senses a mouse part that doesn't usually go there. And we get, or humans, make their own antibodies to that foreign body that's now in your blood. And that is the hypersensitivity reaction. It is manifested for all the world like an allergic reaction and spans the gamut. It could be very mild and could be very lethal depending on the amount and how rapid the response is. And there's a number of things that one could do to mitigate that, is you can make a fully human antibody, and we would, in order for us to go back and make that, we would incur a lot of time, and you'd really have to start all over in the eyes of the FDA, as well it should be. It's a new compound, it has a new safety profile, it has new pharmacokinetics, everything is different and new. Um, for whatever reason, it was made as a chimeric antibody. On the other hand, it sort of incites your immune system to act even more because it recognizes something that's foreign. So the flip side of it is it can stimulate your immune system even more than it would if it was fully humanized. Um, with regards to those markers you showed and all of, for all the different markers, low levels meant that patients had a better survival. Is it? possible from this study to know whether that was just prognostic, like that it's just a way that patients, uh, that these markers might just indicate that those patients had a better survival, or whether it's an effect from your drug, prognostic versus predictive. Um, boy, you're stomping me here. <laughs> uh, I think Asking a tough pointed question. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think that at this point, since they were all baseline factors that were measured, um, this was before therapy was given. Um, it pro probably could be prognostic factors. Um, an argument could be made that less mesothelin, less MPF might imply a smaller tumor burden. One doesn't know. Um, 
but I think that at this point, until we measure them throughout the course of the study while on drug, mm -hmm. we, okay. we don't. So any timelines as to when you think your new trial might um, get well underway? Well, the protocol is in being drafted right now. Um, we're trying to incorporate a lot of these biomarkers into it that perhaps there's going to be a sort of an early look to see if these biomarkers pan out. If they do, then it would be great. It would make the study even more stronger. Um, and um, hopefully by next calendar year, we can start something. Terrific. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, great. So uh, next, uh, we have a presentation from Arduro Biotech, and that will be done by Amy Murphy, who's the Director of Clinical Operations. Thank you, Dr. Kurd. Let me just get settled here for a minute. That's me. Okay, great. Welcome, everyone. Thanks for giving up your blackjack seats to come to this session. I hope you're not in here, all in here, because you, um, you've lost all your money already. There's two more days of the conference, so hopefully you can uh, make it through there. Um, welcome also to the people who are on the webcast. I hear that's um, being webcast live, which is great. And thanks for the um, Mesothelioma Foundation for um, inviting us to speak. Um, we're happy for the opportunity to actually speak directly with patients. Um, you know, we speak a lot f at scientific conferences and we don't get the opportunity as, as pharmaceutical and biotech sponsors a lot of times to speak directly to patients because of patient confidentiality and because you're working directly with our clinical trial sites. So it's a nice opportunity to be able to do that and to meet some of the patients um, who uh, enroll in our clinical trials. So. And it's great that you've also heard a little bit about mesothelin. Um, seems to be a little bit of a theme going on here. It is an important marker that a lot of immunotherapy um, companies are looking at us um, as well. And so you have a, a little bit of an introduction to that. I will also be talking about a vaccine that we are developing that targets mesothelin. So. I'll tell you a little bit about um, immunotherapy and some of the trials going on in that and what we are doing at Aduro um, to develop those immunotherapies. Okay. Um, first, start off by telling you a little bit about Aduro. So we are located in um, Berkeley, California, just down from um, the University of California in Berkeley and across from the Golden Gate Bridge. Um, we have three immunotherapy platforms that we are developing for cancer and infectious diseases. And the, we call them platforms because they are um, they're, they're platform technologies that you can um, modify to target different diseases. Um, as, as our CEO likes to say, it's like a DVD player where you've got a DVD player and you can switch out different DVDs and watch different movies, target different diseases. So um, our three platforms, our, uh, one is a live attenuated, um, double deleted listeria monocytogenous, which is um, the listeria bacteria, and it's live because it is, um, it is a live bacteria still and replicating um, as we use it. And it's attenuated, we've genetically modified it to be safer for use in humans. And um, we modify it by um, deleting some of the genes that make it more toxic um, in, in due to when it's, um, causes an infection. And I will tell you a little bit more about the, um, the attenuated listeria um, vaccine. We also have a GVAX platform, which is a whole, um, whole cell tumor vaccine that is irradiated so it no longer grows. And the concept for that is that you, we take um, tumor cells from former patients and uh, modify them to secrete um, what's called GMCSF, which uh, helps to boost the immune system. And when you inject those in patients, the theory is that, um, that you'll help that patient mount an immune response to the antigens and the markers found on um, those tumor cells. And the third platform that we have is called the cyclic dinucleotide, or CDN adjuvant, which is a small molecule that um, is used, can be used in combination with other types of treatments um, to help boost the immune response of vaccines. 
So we have conducted four um, clinical trials thus far to establish safety of these um, platforms. We've done three phase one vaccine, um, studies with the live attenuated listeria. We've had one phase one trial in hepatitis C. Um, we had one in, we completed one study in patients with advanced cancer. And um, we have had a third study with the listeria um, bacteria alone without any antigens in it. It was um, our first safety study of the bacteria alone. We also have an ongoing right now phase two study with listeria in combination with the GVAX for pancreatic cancer. I'll tell you a little bit about that as well. Um, and then I will be also telling you about a, our currently open trial, which is a phase one study um, for mesothelioma patients. Okay. So this just um, shows you some of the programs that we are working on at Aduro. Um, the CRS-207 is our listeria. Oops, sorry. What did I do? <laughs> okay. Um, the CRS-207 is our listeria platform, which um, targets the mesothelian antigen that you've heard a little bit about um, at the symposium so far. We have um, the... CRS-207 that targets mesothelin, it targets um, the cancers that overexpress mesothelin, and that includes pancreatic cancer and mesothelioma, also um, ovarian and non-small cell lung cancer. So we do have trials, again, I had said we have a phase two in pancreatic cancer, a phase one study ongoing in mesothelioma, and we have um, plans to do studies also in non-small cell lung cancer. We have another listeria strain with different antigens that targets glioblastoma, brain cancer tumors. That um, There's a phase one study that we're just getting started up this year. Uh, we also have programs in list with the listeria strain for prostate and melanoma. And StingVax um, for prostate, that is, um, as I had mentioned, we have the GVAX whole cell tumor vaccine platform that is um, combined with the CDN adjuvant therapy, and we, which we call StingVax. Something else to mention is that Adura, we have just licensed in the um, whole GVAX franchise, which, of which used to be owned by Cell Genesis, who did um, a very advanced studies uh, with the GVAX platform in uh, prostate cancer. Unfortunately, those trials failed. But we, um, there are, is a lot of clinical work still going on with the GVAX platform in um, breast cancer, melanoma, and other indications. So we may also continue development of GVAX or looking at um, GVAX in combination with other, um, with our listeria vaccine. So just to tell you a little bit about immunotherapy and how, how it works, um, the, oops, sorry, the immune system, sorry, I can't find my pointer here. The immune system is um, basically broken down into two components, which is the innate immunity and acquired or adaptive immunity. And um, on, the, on the adaptive side, there are two sides um, which um, get activated, and one is the passive side, which you can get passive immunity, acquired immunity, which is natural through um, passing antibodies from a mother to a fetus. Um, there's also artificial passive um, immunity, which is antibody transfer, infusion of antibodies, similar to what um, Dr. Maltzman was talking about. Um, and really what we are trying to do um, at Aduro is to induce the active immune arm here, which gets um, in a natural infection that is um, what is activated to fight um, natural infections, bacteria and viruses that enter your body. Um, and then there's also on the active arm, there is um, artificial um, induction of your immune response. And this is similar to when you get prophylactic vaccines that um, are um, intended to boost your immune system to uh, develop an immune response against a specific disease um, pathogen or, or um, in this case, cancer cells. So our goal really is to, um, is to provide the weapons for the immune response and the um, T cells to target the um, virus and bacteria infected cells, or again, in this case, the um, cancer cells. Okay. 
And um, as I spoke, there um, of the two arms of the immune system, you have the innate immunity and you also have adaptive immunity. So um, it's important for your body to um, induce both of these types of systems when you get infected. Um, the innate immunity is really the first line of defense. It's a general um, response, not specific to any disease, and it occurs fairly immediately when you um, come into contact with any foreign, um, foreign pathogens, like viruses, bacteria. And um, there are listed here a few of the types of innate immunity. So there are physical barriers, such as skin and, your, and tears. And then there are some elementary immune cells that, um, that get uh, activated as well. On the adaptive immunity side, this is what's um, really important for disease targets and for um, killing the pathogens and cancer cells. So this is specific, it's a response that is specific to certain diseases. Um, it takes a little more time to develop an adaptive response, but it, it is specific, as I said, to the disease. And the important thing about this is that it has immunologic memory so that um, there is long-term memory um, on the cells of the adaptive immune system that will remember and, and seek out, if you have um, future infections, it will seek out the, um, the pathogens and it will recall that um, it had already been exposed to this and it'll continue to fight this infection for you. So um, I won't go into too much detail here, but um, it is important, you know, both of these sides of the immune system are important and it is the innate immunity when it is initially gets activated helps to trigger the adaptive immunity side of it. So I just wanted to give you an idea. There's a lot of information up here, and I'm not going to go through all this information, but wanted to give you an idea of some of the immunotherapy trials that are ongoing for mesothelioma. These are taken off of the clinicaltrials.gov website if you want any Im more information on this. So there are trials ongoing in all phases of, um, of clinical study for mesothelioma for both um, resectable patients and, and non-resectable patients, as well as patients who are um, newly diagnosed or also have, um, have received um, prior therapies. Um, okay. So um, why would we use listeria to make a vaccine? Um, listeria is the bad stuff that you hear about on the news that people get infected from cantaloupes and chocolate milk incidences. Um, but listeria really is a great vector for a vaccine because it induces both the innate immune response as well as the adaptive immune response. And um, Aduro has modified the listeria, as I said, to be safe for clinical use. And the way that, um, that we've done this is to delete out, oops, sorry. Um, two of the uh, genes that make the um, bacteria more um, toxic in a natural infection. So that is here, there's um, one of the genes called internal in B where, that allows the bacteria to enter into normal cells. And then the other one is ACT A, which um, allows the cell, gives the, the cell the ability, or the bacteria the ability to pass into neighboring cells and to spread the infection. So we were able to um, take out both of those genes so that the bacteria can no longer do those functions while still maintaining its ability to be very um, immunogenic. And then um, on top of that, we were able to genetically modify it and insert into the genome of the bacteria um, certain antigen um, genes so that the listeria bacteria will express that antigen and um, hopefully to develop an immune response against particular antigens. Okay. So how does it work? So list, the weakened listeria is given by IV infusion directly into the vein. So then the listeria is, um, is in the blood and then it gets taken up by the immune cells and um, primarily by what's called the CD8 alpha positive dendritic cells, which are um, what are called professional antigen presenting cells. They are um, probably the best cells in the immune system for taking up antigen and presenting it to the T cells, which are the um, 
the cells that we are targeting that um, develop the um, immune response that is specific for that antigen. So the CD8 um, alpha positive dendritic cells, they take up the antigen and they educate the T cells and they activate them to go out and look for this antigen. And so then um, the, C the uh, activated T cells will go out and look for the antigen on the tumor cells and the um, concept is then they'll destroy the tumor cells. And so what we have done at Aduro is um, we've modified the Listeria vaccine to express the mesothelian antigen. Um, and as you've heard, some mesothelioma tumors, um, virtually all the tumors express, overexpress the mesothelian antigen. And you can see here, I'm sorry, I keep using the forward button instead of the um, pointer. You can see here, these are mesothelioma cells that um, on uh, immunohistochemistry staining can show the dark areas here are um, cells with the mesothelial, um, mesothelian antigen on them. Um, and in phase one early studies um, at Johns Hopkins, they sh have showed, in, at least in pancreatic cancer, that um, patients who mounted an immune response to mesothelian had an overall better survival. So we're hoping that it's a good marker for that also in mesothelioma. So we have completed, um, as I mentioned, um, several studies with the CRS-207 mesothelin expressing vaccine. And uh, we have one phase one study that we completed um, back in 2007, 2009, and it was 17 patients, and that included all patients of, of any of the cancers that overexpress mesothelin. So mesothelioma, um, non-small cell lung cancer, pancreatic or ovarian cancer. Um, and in this study, importantly, we showed safety of the vaccine and the, um, we selected the dose, a safe dose level to move forward with further studies. We also showed, importantly, that um, the live bacteria was not shed into the urine or into stool, which was an environmental concern that we would shed, our patients would shed live bacteria, um, but that has not been the case in the studies that we have done. And um, interestingly, um, you know, anecdotal data, but um, when we looked at the survival of the patients in our phase one study, we saw that six out of 17 of the patients, and these are advanced cancer patients that were not expected to live so long, um, they lived unexpectedly long, um, greater than 15 months. One of those was a mesothelioma patient who lived um, more than two years from um, participating on our study. So with those um, uh, enticing survival data from the phase one study, we were able to raise money to go into a phase two study, which we, um, in pancreatic cancer, which we have ongoing right now. So we have currently finished enrollment on the um, 90 patient studies. We have 90 patients who are being followed, um, treated and followed in the pancreatic cancer study. That study is a combination um, vaccine study using the GVAX um, for pancreas cancer. Um, combined with the CRS-207 vaccine. And um, this study had reassured us that um, the vaccines were safe for clinical use at the dose level that we we're testing it, um, so confirmed the safety of both vaccines. Okay. So um, with the phase one and the phase two studies, we um, have demonstrated um, safety. Uh, over 150 infusions of the CRS-207 have been given at one times 10 to the ninth colony forming units. Um, colony forming units is essentially, um, it's a measure of the bacteria. It's basically one bacteria when you dilute it down. Um, so it is pretty amazing that you, we can give a billion, it's basically a billion bacteria um, infused into the blood and we see very um, low toxicity with this. Some of the common um, vaccine related uh, reactions are um, flu-like symptoms, fever, chills, rigors, some nausea, um, infrequently with vomiting, uh, fatigue, and lymphopenia, which is a drop in, the, in a type of the white blood cells. Um, but importantly, uh, most of these events occur within, the 20, within 24 hours of the infusion and resolve on their own um, without chronic symptoms. Some less common vaccine reactions are hypophosphatemia, which is a temporary drop in your um, phosphate levels, hypotension after the infusion, and um, an increased in, increase in your liver function tests. 
um, which is due to the bacteria, listeria naturally goes to the liver, so you see increases in liver enzymes because of that, but again, lasts for a few days and it goes away on its own. Okay. So um, one of the things that we are looking at and a lot of people in the field are interested in is um, combining immunotherapies with um, conventional treatments, chemotherapy and radiation. Um, cancers are really, I'm, as you likely know, a really tricky um, beast. And I think that it really, um, as you see in the field, a lot of chemotherapies are not, um, not working to cure patients. So um, we really believe in the industry that it is a combination of several uh, modalities that will likely be necessary in order to really fight this disease. So um, we look at a lot of different combinations from the, in the pancreatic cancer study. We are doing combinations of vaccines. Um, and then we are also interested, as I said, in looking at combinations with conventional treatments. So um, why do we think this would work? Um, tumor cells have, um, certain mechanisms to evade the immune system. Some of it are physical barriers, just being in um, a solid tumor. It's really difficult for immune cells to get into the um, internal um, cells that are on the inside. So um, it takes a really strong response to be able to break through that. Um, there are also, tumor cells also have certain mechanisms to, um, to attract cells that suppress an immune response. And also, they downregulate um, certain markers on the cells that um, that will attract um, an immune response. And so, this is primarily the reason why cancer is successful in our bodies. They have all these mechanisms to succeed. Um, but we believe that radiation and chemotherapy, what it does is to, it breaks up the tumor and it changes the environment. It it, um, it can. Um, upregulate some of the markers that, um, that the tumor cell naturally downregulates and can um, help boost that response. So um, we believe that in combining the chemotherapy with the um, vaccine that we can get a better immune response and get a better response to the, um, to the tumor itself. So the clinical study that we are doing of um, the CRS-207 and um, chemotherapy for mesothelioma is a phase 1B study, which means that um, it's a phase 1B because it is the first time we're using it in a frontline um, setting for newly diagnosed patients, but um, it's got to be because we have already used CRS-207 um, you know, quite extensively, so it's not generally phase one studies are first in human, um, first safety studies, but we do have safety experience with this product, so it is not truly a, um, a first in man phase one study. Where um, we are combining the vaccine, the CRS-207, with standard of care chemotherapy, where patients are getting two prime vaccinations to um, set up the immune response, and then they're followed by their standard chemotherapy up to six cycles of pemetrexid and cisplatin, followed then by um, boost vaccinations of the CRS-207. And again, it's in newly diagnosed, um, previously untreated patients with malignant pleural mesothelioma. So the study aims to enroll 16 patients at five clinical sites. We have the site um, study is currently open at two sites in the U.S., which is at NCI um, with Rafit Hassan, who also did um, the studies with Dr. Maltzman, and um, at Moffitt Cancer Center with Dr. Scott Antonia. We are opening um, in the near future three additional sites, um, which I'll show you later. Um, the primary objective of the study is safety and to look at immune response um, of using this combination in um, newly diagnosed patients with additional objectives for this study of looking at um, tumor responses and um, an immune analysis of um, tumor tissue um, itself so we can look at the changes going on right in the tumor environment and not just in the blood or, um, or shrinkage of tumors. Um, we look at changes in tumor markers, and also um, we'll be evaluating um, immune correlates to see if we can identify any um, specific immune correlates that would relate to a better response or um, better survival. Okay. So who can enroll in these studies? Um, as I mentioned, it was people with malignant pleural mesothelioma who have not received prior chemotherapy. Um, 
because you cannot be a candidate for um, curative surgery or have had recent surgery. Um, there are lots of uh, long list of other health requirements that, um, that would need to be met. And then patients in clinical and all clinical studies would need to sign informed consent, which describes the procedures and risks involved in participating in a clinical study. And, and lastly, you'd have to be willing, obviously, to follow the protocol schedule and all the requirements for that. Okay. So the schedule for this um, protocol is that you, um, you would have a CT scan initially at screening, so this is um, up to four weeks prior to, um, prior to receiving um, the first dose on study, and there is a number of other screening um, tests that would be done at that time. Um, and then you would start with two vaccinations of the CRS-207 vaccine two weeks apart, and the CRS-207 is administered by an IV infusion. It's a two-hour infusion, and then, as I mentioned, because the reactions occur fairly quickly post-infusion, there's um, a, a four-hour um, post-infusion monitoring period where you would stay at the clinic um, for monitoring of those reactions and wouldn't be discharged until, um, until you're stable. And then um, there is a follow-up visit the next day um, with the CRS-207. And then patients go on to receive up to six cycles of chemotherapy, and this is standard of care um, procedures and um, chemotherapy. And then after the um, chemotherapy, you would, um, patients will receive um, two additional boost vaccinations. Those are three weeks apart. Um, the initial vaccinations are closer together. We don't want to delay patients um, receiving their standard of care for too long. Um, so those are closer together at the beginning, but um, immunologically may be better um, on the boost to separate them out a little bit further. And then patients will continue to be followed um, every eight weeks um, uh, for, until progression. And then during that time, if the patients continue to be stable, they can receive additional boost vaccinations um, every 16 weeks, so about every four months, um, to continue to keep up that immune response. Um, what else? So it's about a, a seven and a half month treatment period um, of total time with the um, prime and the boost vaccinations. Okay. And the clinical trial locations, as I mentioned, we have two that are currently open. The additional sites um, that we are looking at opening um, actually in two weeks will be at the University of Chicago with um, Dr. Kindler, who I believe is here in attendance at this symposium and uh, at the University of Pennsylvania. Hi, Dr. Kindler. <laughs> um, we look forward to opening your site in a couple of weeks. Um, at the University of Pennsylvania um, will also be initiated in a couple of weeks, and then um, the University of California in San Francisco on the West Coast. We will be um, opening, hopefully, by the May-June timeframe of this year. So in summary, um, immunotherapies aim to harness the um, patient's immune system and to treat um, and target diseases. Um, there are several immune therapies being developed for mesothelioma um, for both resectable patients and unresectable patients. Um, Aduro is developing a vaccine, um, the live attenuated double deleted listeria, which expresses mesothelin, when we have an ongoing phase 1b trial with that vaccine. Um, for more information on ours or any of the other trials, um, you can go to the clinicaltrials.gov website. Um, and so I just want to say thank you, and I wanted to um, particularly say thank you to the Mesothelioma Research Foundation for having this symposium. I think it's a really great opportunity for the patients and for us to, um, to hear what is going on in the field. Um, they're a great organization for supporting patients and caregivers and also for supporting the research that is necessary for, um, for us to be able to find a cure for these diseases, and that's much appreciated. I also um, just want to thank the patients and appreciate any um, participation or consideration of being in clinical trials that is just um, an as important piece of 
developing and finding new therapies as it is for the research that we do in industry. Um, we couldn't do it without the participation of patients in trials. So thank you and hope you enjoy the rest of your time at the symposium. Thanks so much. Um, what I find really interesting is that uh, both your compound as well as the Morphotech compound is targeting the same mesothelin just in different ways. So I wondered if you could kind of give me some of the pros and cons of uh, either passive immune approach or the adaptive one that, that you're using. Um, that's a good question. Um, I think with the, um, and I don't know as much about the antibody, maybe Dr. Molson wants to comment on that. Um, but I think that the advantage I know for the um, therapy that we have with the Listeria vaccine is that it has the ability to, um, just with the bacteria alone, to, um, to elicit the innate immune response, as I said, which is a nonspecific response just to the bacteria alone, and then to develop the, um, to activate the T cells to target the mesothelin antigen. So um, that is the active immunotherapy approach versus the um, passive antibody approach where um, they are infused with the, um, with the antibody and to enhance their immune um, response. So your current trial has, uh, is planned for 16 patients. And what, what type of signal would you be looking for to decide whether to go on to do a larger trial? That's a, um, a good question. We are looking at um, progression-free survival. We're looking at immune response um, uh, to mesothelin, so, um, and we're looking at markers as well. So um, just it is an exploratory pilot study, so if we see some in, any encouraging, promising data there, we are hoping to be able to um, ex expand and extend that study out to collect more data on that. Mm -hmm. And if you were going to do a next, well, if you were going to, design the next trial, what, w what would you foresee? How would you design it? That's a good question. I hope we have the opportunity to <laughs> <laughs> um, Okay, and so uh, what are the timelines? I mean, how long do you think it'll be before your trial is done? And then you can show us some of your data. Um, good question. We're hoping, um, you know, we actually have had the two sites open um, for several months. Um, enrollment has actually been slower than we anticipated. So we're hoping by getting the word out and opening additional sites, we'll be able to complete the enrollment this year. Um, and then we would likely have um, some data on this trial in hopefully the middle or late of next year. Perfect. Well, thank you very much. I think thank this was you. a great session.